I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. We will talk tonight with Judge Sean Pearson about his journey as the first black judge in northeastern Minnesota. We'll have a report on how Muhammad Ali continues to influence boxers around the world and right here in the Northland. And local health care providers talk about the Delta variant and how it is changing the COVID landscape. Those stories and voices of the region coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching and it's been nice to see some rain this week, Denny. We really needed it. We surely did. We had some desperately needed rain. It rained almost all night last night here in Duluth at least. So it did. It was good. Cleared yeah. up just in time for the weekend. It did. Thank you very all much, right. Julie. In fact, that rain has allowed the Minnesota DNR now to remove burning restrictions in 14 counties. Burning restrictions were lifted in St. Louis, Itasca, Kuchiching, and several other counties in our area. But restrictions remain in place at the tip of the arrowhead in Lake and Cook counties. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has removed a Hermantown site from the federal Superfund list. Removal of the old Arrowhead refinery site indicates cleanup has been completed. The refinery dumped toxic waste into an unlined lagoon for decades, and the site was added to the Superfund list back in 1984. Early voting is being encouraged for the November 2nd general election in Duluth. Voters can request an absentee ballot by contacting the city clerk's office or going to minvotes.org. That's mnvotes.org. Voters can also vote in person at City Hall on any business day. No appointment is needed. And UW-Superior students will take part in the International Beach Cleanup on Wisconsin Point Saturday. Students are partnering with the City of Superior, Alliance for the Great Lakes, and Friends of Lake Superior Reserve for the event. Anyone who would like to help should meet at lot number one on Wisconsin Point at 10 a.m. Saturday. Well, this summer, history was made when Minnesota Governor Tim Walz appointed Northeastern Minnesota's first African-American <coughs> judge in the 6th Judicial District. Wall said he brings a wealth and depth of experience and steadfast leadership to the bench. And so joining us now is Sean Pearson, District Court Judge seated here in Duluth. Welcome, Judge. Nice to meet you. We certainly appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You made history, as we said, here in, in town, and you're the first black judge now to serve the 6th Judicial District. Perhaps how can that make some difference in maybe some of the cases you're about to hear? You know... I would like to think it doesn't make much of a difference, Denny, um, but I think it does, um, and here's why. Um, <clears throat> in northern Minnesota and in many of the, 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 the counties here, um, the defendants who sit in uh, the jails look more like me than perhaps like you, mm -hmm. for, the, for the most part. Understandable. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a large number of minority defendants, and there's not a, a, I'm, I'm the only minority on the bench. Um, to this point, um, um, and I think it, it, I've actually had, um, I'll share with you a, a, an experience I had the other day, actually. Um, one of the bailiffs um, who was present at uh, my investiture came up to me in the hall and he, he had something to urgently share with me, it seemed, and I said, you know, what, what's, uh, what, what's going on? And he said, I wanted to tell you that I was up at the jail the other day and someone who was in custody came up to him and said that he wanted me to hear his case. Mm. And he said, well, why is that? He said, because he looks like me. And I thought about it for a minute and, and you know, it's, it, it feels like a really simple thing. Um, and obviously there's no, um, you know, allegiance or anything like that that would play into that. But I think what it really does is it, it strengthens the trust. It strengthens the public trust. Um, hopefully it'll lead to some, uh, some additional civic engagement um, because of that trust. And, and, and really, as an officer of the court, um, what we really operate on is the public's trust, mm -hmm. um, that we're hearing cases in an objective manner following the law and um, you know, being an example to the community. Mm -hmm. Judge, is ensuring justice and ensuring social justice always the same thing? 
Whew, that's a good question. Um, I don't necessarily think so. I don't necessarily think so. Um, I think they're two different things. Um, because of the structure and, and the folks who set up the structure, you know, we're all navigating within the legal system. Um, we have driver's licenses, right? You have to get a license to do certain things. You need to, you know, all these different regulations. And those systems were set up um, not uh, with an eye towards social justice, of course. Um, and in fact, you might see them as actually polar opposites in, in certain respects, depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. For those who are not familiar with your background, just talk a little bit about yourself and, and your path to the bench. Sure. Well, I'm the first lawyer in my family. Mm -hmm. um, I, no one ever, uh, uh, growing up, no one ever suggested that I should go to law school or, or even, I, I, frankly, I don't even think I'd met a lawyer until I'd met my wife's family. Um, there's a, a number of lawyers in, in her family. Uh, my father-in-law practiced social security disability mm -hmm. for many years. Uh, just retired. Um, but growing up in a small town in Ohio, um, I was surrounded by a number of individuals who were professional, professionals, um, ma mainly medical folks, uh, because my mom's a registered nurse. She uh, studied to become a nurse when I was in grade school. I really barely saw her <laughs> during that time period, um, night, night school and all that kind of thing. Um, and I was raised a, a lot by my grandparents. Um, my grandfather was a World War II uh, Navy veteran, um, worked in a steel mill after that, and some of the, the reasons why um, I feel like it's important to, to, to do this job mm -hmm. is because of, of them. Um, you know, coming back from World War II, um, going to work for many, many, many years, and really not necessarily um, getting the full benefit of that American dream necessarily, um, I think was something that I really took uh, to heart. And when I, um, after I graduated college and I was uh, trying to figure out really what to do with my life with a, a degree in anthropology, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the possibilities are, are, are endless. Um, I started working in a plaintiff side asbestos firm in Chicago. And I got to travel around to different states to interview individuals who had been injured by asbestos, whether they were pipe fitters, sure. boiler fitters, steam fitters, electricians. Mm -hmm. You sound and like an empathetic person. Can you, you like people, it sounds like. Can I do. you bring empathy to the bench? I feel like I do. I feel like, and I, I, I feel like I try to do that every day. Um, it, it, it really is that core uh, belief that everyone deserves a fair uh, shake. Uh, and a fair chance in the eyes of the law that really brings me to this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over the years, uh, in looking at your, your bio, you've volunteered as a, a mentor, as a coach. Mm -hmm. How important are positive role models for young people to maybe keep them from ever having to appear in your courtroom? Yeah. I think the importance of mentorship is really one of the highest uh, things that we can do mm -hmm. um, as individuals and have the greatest impact on our communities. And it is so simple. It, it feels so simple to simply show up or give a speech or you know, go in front of a group of kids and say, hey, this is what I do. This is how I earn a living. This is why I like doing what I'm doing. This is how I'm helping people. And that seems like a really simple, easy thing to do that many of us can do. Um, but the benefits to that, just simply seeing someone in a position and, and putting yourself in, in their shoes can have a great impact on a, on a kid who might be faced with really life-altering decisions and not really even know it. Yeah. Uh, I, I read where you grew up in poverty, Judge. Will that have any effect on how you sit on the bench and, and how you operate as a judge? Well, I think it would, our, our backgrounds are, are always, uh, always there, always there, of course. And I think it gives me a sensitivity to some of the unique issues. Um, when I was representing parents in child protection cases in Hibbing in Virginia, um, in northern Minnesota, uh, poverty was par for the course. Um, drug use, mm -hmm. uh, par for the course. Um, domestic abuse, mm, in play many times, um, too frequently. 
And those are kind of, of things that can really derail people from reaching their full potential. Um, I think that growing up as a poor kid in, in Southeast Ohio um, has given me some of that empathy um, to really listen to people. Because sometimes if, if the, the, the folks that we see, um, particularly the folks in custody um, that, that, I, that I see, um, and unfortunately they're on video yeah. um, these days because of COVID and other issues, um, but they're scared as hell. Mm -hmm. And they, I always try to ask individuals who appear uh, before me who are, 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 don't have their full freedom, you know, what is your plan? Yeah. What are you going to do? You know, sure. If, when Judge, you, I wish we had out. more time yeah. to unveil yeah. that. We, we're of out of time right now. Sure. Hope to have you back someday, that's for sure. Yeah. Judge Sean Pearson, District Court Judge, 6th District here in Duluth. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Sir. Pleasure having you here. Thank you. Muhammad Ali, a documentary by Ken Burns, premieres this Sunday on PBS. Our producer Ramona Morozas and videographer A.J. Larson met with some local boxers to learn more about Ali's legend and his impact on the boxing community. Zach Walters here. I am uh, the head coach, gym owner of uh, Jungle Gym. We got the Jungle Gym Boxing Academy. It's a 24 hours boxing gym here. We're here today to talk about Muhammad Ali, his influences on, you know, myself as a boxer, as a coach, um, how, how the, the, the spirit of Muhammad Ali just kind of floats through boxing in general. I read when I was just a young boxer, I'm not going to be exact, but uh, he says to be the best, you got to believe the best. If you're not, pretend you are. There's those moments, everybody has them, little moments of doubt. You know, but he always just exuded this confidence. You know, I wondered how much of that was show and how much of that was, did he really believe in himself, you know? My name is Andrew Griggs. I've been boxing since I was very, like, little at a young age. Usually his quotes and what he says in the past inspired me a lot. He said, don't count the days, make the days count. And I just want to be like those next people, be out there, be one of the best people of color to step foot in the ring. Usually people fight on the wrong road, you know, do other things and like boxing kept me out of doing all that stuff, so I stayed in the gym. If there was people out there like looking up to me young ages, you know, I just want to like lead them down the right path. I'm Jesse Walters. I was born in North Dakota, but I've lived in Duluth like, I don't know, like 14, 15 years, I'm pretty sure. One of my favorite things he always says is, uh, What's my name in one of his, one of his fights? Is because they were calling him Cassius Clay still, and he ne he hated that name. There was one guy that would, just kept calling him Cassius Clay, and in, in the middle of the fight, when he knocked him out, he just he stood over him and said, "What's my name? What's my name?" Because he said, "My name's Muhammad Ali now." I am Sue. My whole family's Sue. I don't know. There's something always about me where I felt like people don't want to see me win. People where I come from are not always the most successful people. So when I win, it feels like I win for like a lot of more people than just myself. I like his job. I always loved his job. He always had a good dancing around and his head movement and footwork, you know, that gave me like motivation to like, want to make me want to step my game up too. How he can move like that. I ain't never seen a heavyweight move like that. He's quick. Yeah, I love the way he talked. Oh my gosh. Some of the funnest things about watching Muhammad Ali um, footage is watching his interviews. That guy knew how to deal with people. He was, he was just a character. He was a gold medalist in the Olympics, and he did it with a fluid, fast-handed style that was so unique that he just blew through everybody. The Russians and the Cubans have always had dominant boxers at these international tournaments, and Muhammad Ali had a style that neither one of those guys could figure out. His pop, 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 he made it look easy. I watched those fights, I'm like, ah. Looks makes it look easy, but I see what Olympic boxing is. I know what goes into boxing at that level, and it's incredible, and the guy made it look easy. So I think winning the gold medal, definitely huge for his career. His fight with Sonny Liston. Taking a stand during the Vietnam War 
There, there's all kinds of up in the air things that could happen to him. I mean, he had, he had to go to prison for a while. You know, he had to do jail time. I mean, th those moments where he, he took a stand um, and fought through things in the ring and out of the ring. He was a fighter. Um, he's such a fighter, you know, and I think that's, I think that's where courage comes from. You know, the courage is like, you feel the fear, but you push through it. That's courage. I like that, like, he stood up for a lot of things. He, like, don't take anything. I'll say he inspired, like, a lot of other African-American people. You know, he was always talked about, he was always in somebody's mention when they mentioned boxing. And it just made a lot of like, young African-Americans want to, like, be just like him, you know, follow his footsteps. He unlocked a lot of, uh ways for other people to come into the sport you know it's always like the underdogs are never supposed to win but when they do win it's like the biggest upset and it, like he said it shakes the world when people aren't supposed to win but they do win so he definitely unlocked a lot of ways and you know it's acceptable now for a lot of people to be in sport there's him like not going into the army and stuff like that and people were trying to say like oh he hates his country and all this and all that but like he didn't hate his country but he felt like his country hated him because you know, he was apparently doing something wrong just because of the way he was born. A lot of people just don't understand the, the fact that there was so much racism going on back in the day. And he used his sport to be more than just a sport. It was a voice and you know, make a change in the world. It's important for them to know about Muhammad Ali. It's, it's an important thing for, for kids to see success that looks like them. Duluth, Twin Ports, it's not a very culturally diverse place. And so boxers in the gym, they need to see success that there isn't like a, another white guy. Well, I like exploring different places, boxing different places, different rings, stepping on different stages, you know, and performing at my best. One thing I love about boxing, as it relates to the journey of kids that come to the gym, is, is boxing can give these kids wings to fly to get outside their community to see that the world is such a big place and this isn't all there is. There's so much world out there. Just because we're in the US and we're in Duluth doesn't mean it's the same in like Dallas, Texas or Sacramento or, or you know, Atlanta or Buffalo, New York. You know, everything is different, you know. The Ken Burns documentary is a, is a really important thing because, you know, the accomplishments of Muhammad Ali in and out of the ring should never be forgotten. I feel like it's a good, you know, learning for a lot of people that don't know about culture and boxing. There's, there's a lot of culture in boxing. He's leading people and showing people that there is hope, you know, that you can do this and, you know, you can make your dream come true even if you're not supposed to be the winner. Being a fighter was more than just him fighting with his fists. He took that and fought other things in life to, to make things better. The Ken Burns Ali documentary focuses on one of the most remarkable individuals of the 20th century. Ali was a three-time heavyweight champion who captivated millions of fans. He insisted on being himself and became a global icon and inspiration. Here's a preview of the documentary. Do you know your dad is the baddest man in the world? Without any further introduction, Muhammad Ali! He's young, he's handsome, they know it. Never talk about it. who's gonna stop me? Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I'm well, showing the world that you can stay yourself and get respect from the world. He's 22 years old. Ah! And he's standing up to the whole establishment. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali starts Sunday, September 19th at 8, 7 central, only on PBS. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. This week, Wisconsin public reporter, public radio reporter, Danielle Kading is our guest. The latest is that, you know, Wisconsin tribes and northern Wisconsin communities and a grassroots citizens group um, called Lake Superior Not For Sale are pushing back against a Duluth company's proposal to bottle and sell water from a well near Lake Superior. Um, Duluth resident Crystal Myshack, who owns the company Crystal Clear, uh, she and her father 
sought a special land use permit to harvest water from an artesian well earlier this spring, and they want to move it in tanker trucks to a bottling facility in Superior. And opponents say that allowing Crystal Clear to go forward with this would exploit a loophole in a landmark agreement that bars water diversions from the Great Lakes, and that's known as the Great Lakes Compact. Um, you know, they fear that the proposal would threaten water resources in the region, and they note that the area is currently witnessing drought conditions, and that this comes at a time when water scarcity is really top of mind, especially in the Western US. And so the company's consultant found that this well flows at a rate of around three and a half gallons per minute, roughly 5,000 gallons per day. Um, an appeals board in Bayfield County recently upheld the denial of that special land use permit um, after the county zoning committee rejected the proposal this past spring. And so my shack's attorney, Jack Perry, who's out of Minneapolis, says that they plan to appeal the board's decision in Bayfield County Circuit Court. Um, you know, they're arguing that the Wisconsin DNR or the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has sole permitting authority over groundwater wells. And they think that the county could be exposed to more than $250,000 in damages and legal fees for denying the proposal. Um, but the town's attorney, Max Lindsay, argues that the county is just exercising its authority over land use. And they note that the proposal really didn't fit with how that area is zoned, which is for residential development and associated recreational use. It's the first time in seven years that water levels on Lake Superior are on par with the lake's long-term average. You know, after we've witnessed a string of record highs in August, the average water levels on Lake Superior dropped less than an inch to 602.17 feet. Um, that matches the long-term average for the first time since April 2014. And so the lake was nearly a foot below water levels in August of last year. Um, so it's so it's declined roughly 11 inches and it has continued to even this month. Um, and that decline is basically driven by abnormally dry to extreme drought conditions that we're seeing across the Lake Superior Basin. Um, we've just seen, you know, not very much snow uh, or ice cover over this past winter and really not that much rainfall in the earlier part of the year and less than average rainfall really for the entire Lake Superior Basin. This is all coming off of the record setting rise that we saw in water levels from beginning around the early part of 2013 where levels just surged across the Great Lakes and eroded shorelines and caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to infrastructure along coastal communities. <music> Tourism officials and city leaders have been at odds over this proposal to create a tourism commission in Superior. Um, and so this proposal came before the city council earlier this month and um, this week they Took it up again in their committee of the whole meeting and, and essentially city council members voted seven to three to create the tourism commission and in a separate vote they approved that commission using 70 percent of the room tax dollars that the city takes in for tourism promotion and development beginning in january of next year and you know travel superior is the current tourism entity that currently contracts to receive that 70 percent of those room tax revenues and so with the creation of this commission, that body could basically contract with not just Travel Superior, but other entities to promote the city. And Travel Superior and several city councilors, including Brent Fennessy and Keith Kern, opposed this move, um, saying it may negatively impact not just Travel Superior, but the tourism industry as a whole. Um, kind of questioning the sustainability of funding that some organizations in the city receive. Um, but um, Mayor Jim Payne says that tourism commissions are used widely by large cities across the state and that they've been discussing these changes for months as part of a broader effort to look at city contracts and review them. And Councillor Jenny Van Sickle argued that creating the commission will create competition and unlock opportunities for the city.
COVID-19 cases in the region continue to rise again despite the availability of vaccines. While the vaccines have been highly effective, the contagiousness of the Delta variant has local health officials concerned. In a video conference Thursday, Itasca County health officials agreed FDA approval of the vaccine for younger children will be a key step. For the ages of 5 to 11, that we expect to see an FDA approval coming within the next couple of months. And I know there is certainly interest in having this vaccine group, uh, this group, pop, uh, this population vaccinated because we want to keep our kids in school and keep everyone safe and healthy. Uh, one of the unique things we are seeing with the Delta variant is uh, when one person in the family gets infected uh, with COVID, we are now seeing the entire family test positive. And so uh, it is uh, it is very spreadable and uh, it, it's fueling our concerns about especially the school age kids. Um, having having entire classrooms get infected at at a uh, at the same time. With the amount of uh, community transmission that we have right now, I do think it is important to be you know cautious about what you're doing and how you're spending your time. If you know about how the Delta variant works and how much more contagious it is than the previous um, types of COVID we've seen, it's probably a good idea to think about you know where you're going and, um, you know, trying to stay outside, especially now while it's still nice. Um, if you're having social gatherings, things like that. Our time is up this week, but you can keep up with our latest posts by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the WDSC website for the latest program updates and information about the station and download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite PBS programs, including episodes of Almanac North. And Danny, I hope that you get a chance to get out and enjoy some nice sunny weather this weekend. It should be weekend. a wonderful, beautiful weekend. It should indeed. Thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. We'll see you next time.